little while ago, I embarked on a what was supposed to be a long-term sequential project to examine uh, this fascinating variable in role-playing um, related as it is to fantasy and other science fiction content of different types of person. And it's usually tagged as race in the literature of fantasy and science fiction and also in role-playing. Now, that word is clearly taking on an individualized meaning, which, at least in science fiction, is more akin or strongly implied to be species. But as any biologist will tell you, science fiction has always adapted that concept very much into something else. Um, without going into that in too, too much detail, um, I think that it is its own phenomenon across this literary or popular culture. And role-playing is part of that. Well, a lot of things happened in the last two years that demanded my attention. And so I never really got back to it. We did one Monday Lab that I thought was a really, really good start. And it was called Half Breed. And I'm taking these things really like topical variable by topical variable. And that whole business was, well, let's examine this issue of, you know, the races or whatever that's supposed to mean in role playing um, these really narrow topics at a time. So that one had to do with characters, playable characters, whose parents came from what in setting were designated as different races. And okay, well, how was this treated as a player option? How is this treated as setting content? Anyway, you can go see that. It's got a couple of videos associated with it. Today, I want to draw everyone's attention um, and set up for a group discussion about something else, um, kind of the opposite in some ways, because now we're not talking about uh, the, the designated, ambiguous, and perhaps provocative status, um, or at least an opportunity for saying something unique that you get with the half-breed topic. Instead, I want to talk about something a little more disturbing. I want to talk about what is clearly um, textual racism. So I think it is actually indicative of something going on with the authors, whether it's deliberate or not, whether it is, um, you know, deliberate in the sense of trying to communicate, which is a different thing, um, or what is really interesting. I'll let us uh, develop that. And so I'll, I can only just basically do it through examples. Now, the, um, the really shocking one, and I'm, I'm going to start with the, the, the one that really probably should have been, you know, the, the, the take home, the, the knockout punch. But I'm going backwards. Uh, this is a game published in 2000 and it is called World Tree. And it won kind of furry awards and stuff like that. The characters are all semi-anthropomorphic or in one case, non-anthropomorphic um, animal critters. It's a very odd setting. It's not intended to be realistic at all. There is an enormous tree that is the world, or at least so much of it that we're treating it as the setting. And there are cities on it and whole nations, you know, nestled in different places on it and play wildernesses that are just more parts of the tree that you can go and explore on. Anyway, that's sort of the conceit. But what's kind of interesting is that you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight player character races. And uh, they are pretty familiar. Uh, there are bear people and there are dog people. There are raccoon people. Uh, there are kind of mantis people, otter people, uh, the, the non-anthropomorphic panther people. So basically gets played an actual cat. And then a couple of strange ones, uh, little feathery dragons and a uh, floating octopus. Uh, anybody who's familiar with this game is like, oh, the octopus, you know, because that's kind of, they're, they're kind of fun one. Well, I think they are. Well, okay, so what's not to love? So this game is, I, I will say, uh, very much billed as the game of tolerance and a game of understanding one another, even though we have different and diverse worldviews. Uh, that we, you know, we, we group up together and we find common ground and it's, it seems very, very positive. Most of the, of the artwork is consistent with a lot of the anthropo you know, anamorphic, anthropomorphic, 
um, furry scene with characters who are very easily relatable. You have like an irate otter woman, you know, ordering a clearly misbehaving, you know, panther person, you know, out of her shop. Or you have kitchen scenes and, you know, people playing and stuff like that. Um, this goes kind of oddly with everything to do with players mentioned in the book, in which it's pretty much assumed that the character, the players are fairly aggressive and fairly violent and fairly, you know, hard to manage. So it's one of these games where the, the sort of positive GM world and reader world is a little different from the presumed, um, you know, rather id driven, you know, player influence. But all that aside, or maybe not, the the eleven or the the eight groups that I just mentioned, uh, they are called primes, and I want to kind of go with a couple of interesting points about being a prime and what is it. So there's these seven gods who made the world. Um, I know there's eight of the, the player character races. There's always something kind of kooky about that. But anyway, um, so then each of the gods made a species or two of people, the prime species, and set them on the world to live. The primes are the focus of the gods' attention and of this book's attention as well. Um, so that's one thing. The, the gods who made the world also made the species. This is a not an unusual uh, device in the literature and in the the games um with whatever implications you choose to perceive in it um so then uh, we move to a section that introduces us to the non-primes there are thousands of species of sentient and near sentient beings on the world tree they are not prime they are called non-primes the nicer word or monsters the creator gods evidently don't think that they're very important. Now, this is kind of interesting. The, the phrasing is not clear whether this is in setting thinking or what you, the user, are kind of supposed to internalize and adopt. Um, not just as what the fictional beings think, but what you're kind of supposed to get and adopt as you know, purposes of play. Um, some, if you take the latter, then things start getting a little squicky. Uh, notice that there's thousands of these, not, you know, eight more. Um, the, let's see. The prime species were told to cooperate with each other and instructed in certain of the arts of civilization. While they are not always close friends, they are usually willing to work together and share their complementary strengths against threatening monsters. So that's what primes do. The primes know that they are the main focus of divine interest in the world. This gives many of them a sense of purpose that the non-primes lack. Okay. Um, every, there is one key physical difference between primes and non-primes. Every world tree being has an aspect of their being, the magirium, connecting the minds to the spirit. To the magic sense, a magirium looks like a tree. The magirium of a prime looks like a segment of the world tree itself, with branches flattened on top and extending from the trunk like spokes. The magiriums of the non-prime species look like lesser kinds of tree with round branches. Prime scholars consider this the touchstone of primeness and a concrete sign of the prime's importance in the universe. Non-prime scholars usually call it a coincidence or grudgingly admit that their own species is secondary. Now, I want to call your attention to this because it's not just cherry-picked. This is this kind of phrasing goes on and on and on. I mean, I go to the next, you know, section where we go to the non-primes as, you know, game mechanics. I mean, we can keep going through. I've been through this, and it is consistent every time. There's this weird statement, which is blatantly supremacist. And then there's kind of a statement which sort of looks like it's going to mitigate it or show that the first statement was in setting and kind of prejudiced and you know so it's going to kind of turn it around but then you read it again and it is kind of confirmatory it never quite takes it through and you you're just like wait a minute you know uh where's the other shoe that's going to say that the non-primes actually you know 
aren't inferior or you know something like you know rebel some rebel scholars suggest that this distinction is you know arbitrary or something like that but that never happens it always ends on that oh so you're not subverting your first really 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 racist thing okay so let's i mean you can you can go on i mean this is <laughs> Primes often believe that non-primes are unimportant, that they were put on the world tree for the benefit of the primes, and they can be killed, looted, exploited, or whatever as desired. Now, if you're me, you're expecting that next sentence to subvert that, to say, well, the primes believe this, and then it says something that shows that either in setting or between us as reader and author, that we know that's not the case. This is a prejudice that the primes hold. But let's see what it really says. Very next sentence. It says, the premise is true. The non-primes were created as subsidiary species. Really? And then the next st statement gets, I think, in my opinion, a little murky. Maybe you think it's coherent. We'll see. The conclusion, the notion that they can be killed, etc., says, the conclusion is a matter of ethics, not history or science, a thorny philosophical issue that confronts adventurers when the enemy scorns, surrender, and beg for their lives. That sounds a lot like fake-ass ethics to me, what they call shoot and cry. You know, my goodness, whatever shall we do with these Indian children who are crying and begging for their lives? Well, you know, if we're better people, we'll let them grow up and our children will suffer for it, you know, in the, in the next novel. Um, and if we're not as good children, or sorry, if we're not as good people, but we are pragmatic and understanding the realities of life, then we're going to shoot them all. And then we're going to feel really bad about it. So, I mean, that, do you really think, I mean, do you think I'm overreading that? Because that is exactly what I'm looking at. You can see it in the history of the American West. You can see it in Israel, Palestine. You can see it again and again and again in these very explicit terms. So, all right. Um, not to mention another culture that I could mention that should come to mind without too much trouble. 